I'm doing a charity event or if there's some big comedian on the road that says, hey, Dante, it's, you know, Kevin Hart wants you to open for him and host. Sure. Phase on Love. He's the big heavy set black guy who played the manager in Elf. He played Big Worm in Friday. He's in a million movies. Yeah. Anyway, he and I went to junior high and high school together and I show up to the comedy store and he's sitting there as the bouncer. And I went, you're not 21. And then I go back to school that that winter and, and I'm like, where's my Eric? And people go, oh, he moved to L.A. He's on a new show called uh, In Living Color. And I didn't know this show, but this is the show that, you know, the Wayans had and it's what made Jim Carrey famous. And well, I didn't recognize the name because he had changed it to Jamie Foxx and he now has an Academy Award. How crazy, right? That's bonkers. That's a great story. I love that. Welcome to Mamwa. I'm Gordy Camp, your host, and this is the podcast that includes you into my most famous song lyrics. He's a middle-aged man with an attitude, and he didn't even have one till he met you. That's right, I'm the middle-aged man, and my attitude will chatter us through all things that I'm passionate about, from spirituality, the gym and fitness, food, traveling, and music or movies. Quick disclaimer, this list is not exhaustive. So you can get on or you can get off and join us for the episodes that you like the sounds of. Dip in or dip out, as long as you keep dipping. Either way, we've got something to say and we're going in three, two... One way to keep your mood intact when you're feeling down. Comedy! So welcome to Mamwa. I'm your host, Gordy Camp. And today, we're not just talking with a celebrity comedian who's living in the LA lifestyle, but we're going to have lots of fun and a good laugh at the same time. And we might even hear some celebrity gossip too. So settle yourself in, everyone, and welcome Dante Ruskilelli to the show. Dante, how are you? Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, buddy. I'm really happy to be here. I'm coming to you live from Hollywood, my house in Hollywood. And uh, is that accent of yours Tennessee or Georgia? No, it's Scottish. Oh, (laughs) Scottish. Yeah. Got it. Um, (laughs) I'm just joking. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, I was going to make a joke about you flying to England and asking how your flight was, but my attempt at comedy is absolutely terrible. Um, <laughs> so let's start with um, a bit of history on yourself. So just for the listeners, I reached out to Dante about his his comedy and some of his business work that he does, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, so Dante, you've been in over 20 films and TV shows. Recently, one that we can see over here in the UK, um, Unfallen, we can get that on Prime. And other than yourself, you've also worked with some big names in Hollywood, which is where you are right now. Um, So have you done much work in the UK? Okay, so that's a great question. And uh, the answer is this. I wish I did more. Okay. So as a comedian, I have performed at the Lewisham Theatre. I performed at the Hackney Empire Theatre and all over uh, at a whole bunch of bases that we have over there, U.S. bases um, throughout England and uh, the U.K. And so um, that is what I have done over there and not much else. I mean, of course, my movies and and TV shows that I've been on go over there. Um, I know that when I was on Last Comic Standing, um, that was something that was over there because I had to do a lot of promo in the U.K., I don't know. I, my wife and I are actually even considering coming over there and, and maybe even living there. We, um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get dual citizenship um, uh, in, the, uh, in just Europe, period. There's, I'm, you know, but it, it's getting weird in America. <laughs> in what way? <laughs> well, politically, it's getting really weird. I, I, I grew up, you know, where, sure. You know, people have different political views, but over here they're starting to turn into gang views. Okay. So it's like if you're with the red gang or the blue gang, you don't talk to the red gang or the you know or whatever. And you know, we've got a convicted felon running on one side, and no one's saying a word about it on that yeah. side. They're actually putting on shirts with him as a convicted felon instead of going, "Yeah, let's find someone better." So it's getting weird. So it's being celebrated rather than anything right. else. And then our our neighbors. You know, at first I was excited. They had, uh, uh, Mexico had just elected a, a, a female president. And then you find out 37 people who ran against her were assassinated this year. 37. Wow. And it's like, man, things are getting weird in North yeah, America. Yeah, it sounds like it. If you move to the UK, have you decided which part of the UK you might move to? 
I don't know. I like London. I, you know, I like to be in the big cities. I was born on a Navy base here in California. And okay. I always dreamt of getting out, you know, because there was nothing there. We didn't, two, the, we had two story buildings only that you had to walk up. I'd never even seen an elevator until my parents took me to a city. So I'm a city kitty now. I don't, I don't want to ever go back. Yeah. So whilst you're trying to get over here, there's thousands of people trying to get to LA. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, see, here's the difference. L.A., it's great. And I'm not putting it down. And I love the weather here and everything else. It's for me, it's not about that or even the political stuff. I just feel like I, I'm at the point in my life where I go, wow, I, I don't have to stay in one spot anymore because the Internet allows me, you know, when I go on the road now, even as a comedian and I travel the world, I remember I was in Egypt making deals for some of my clients because I'm also a talent manager. Yeah. And so it kind of doesn't matter where I'm located anymore. And same with the actors. Like I have a, uh, an actress I just took on as a client who lives probably near you somewhere. And she comes out here for auditions but doesn't need to live here. Yeah. I think you're right. Like the internet plays a huge part now. And I think so many companies like transitioned to a completely 100% different way of working when the pandemic hit worldwide like you're bonkers. telling me yeah you're telling me like all right so as a comedian i couldn't go perform and then i have about 120 actors celebrities and clients that i was trying to find work for and they're all wondering what is Dante going to do and the only thing i could figure out to do during that pandemic since no one could leave is get as many influencers and celebrities sponsorship deals because yeah. people still wanted to sell products People were still buying on Amazon, you know, and so that's what we had to figure out. We had to figure out lots of different ways to make money, and we did. We figured out doing online shows, and then, you know, there's comics out there who have been a comic since the pandemic who have never performed live. Yeah. They've only done online shows. Isn't that interesting? It is. Yeah. But it's, I've noticed a massive difference in, like, what's the, the best way to put it is attention spans online. and it's the attention span is so much smaller than it used to be just in the You're last few years. Me, it's mental. You must watch these, um, your <laughs> analytics on your podcast and go, what do you mean you watched for 30 seconds and then it dropped off? Or what do you mean you watched half of it and dropped off? It got better right at the half. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I will post these six seconds or 20 second clip and I'll look at the analytics and it says dropped off after, you know, half the time. And it's like, are you joking? It's a six second clip. Yeah. So two seconds now, nah, nah. <laughs> right, that's it. Um, so, like, you've not been much in the UK with your comedy. So how about the US? How far have you been in the US? With, I'm, I'm assuming you go everywhere. Yeah, so out of the 50 states, I think that there are two I've never performed in. Wow, okay. And they just don't have a lot of comedy clubs in those two places. Um, but yeah, I performed everywhere else. I was even just in Alaska two days ago uh, performing and that was fun and crazy. Um, that, you know, as, as, as someone who lives in the 48 main states, not outside of Hawaii and Alaska, whenever you go to those, it feels like you're in a foreign country. I and mean, that used to be Russia. Up until 59, it was Russia. Yeah. So it looks like a whole different world over there. It's crazy. Wow. I know it's dependent on what's happening as well, but how many different shows do you tour with? Do you do like one set at one time and then move on? Like, do you mix the material up? How, how yeah, do you so work so that's it? a great question. Yeah, so uh, after doing this for 37 years, I've got hours and hours of material to pull from. However, if you watch any comic go on tour for a while, you're going to find that they're trying to work on certain stuff for about a year or two. And so if you saw me, let's say two years ago, and you come back to my show now, you're probably going to see out of my hour long show about 15 minutes that you recognize because I'm still working on it and I haven't let it go yet. And another 45 you haven't seen. And then the other thing that's unique about my shows, um, most people will come back three and four times in the same week and you go, how could you do that if you're doing most of the same material? It's because at least 20 minutes of my hour long set is talking to the crowd. Yeah. And that makes people come back and go, it doesn't matter if he does the same other 40 minutes, that 20 minutes changes every night. And that's what I'm paying for. And do you MC as well? 
No, that's very rare because you know what's crazy is you when you start out as a as a as a comedian, you usually are the host. You're usually yeah, yeah, the yeah. MC. And then you move up to the feature spot, which is the second person. And then the headliner is the last person to go up. Once you become a headliner, it's real crazy. You never see your friends again because they're all headliners. And then you take off to Alaska. They take off to Nebraska. Someone goes to England. And then the next week we all switch and we're somewhere else and you never see them again. And so the only time I host is if I'm doing a charity event or if there's some big comedian on the road that says, hey, Dante, it's, you know, Kevin Hart wants you to open for him and host. Sure. But yeah, I mean, it's also a real skill, you mm -hmm. know, like I'm used to doing an hour, whereas these guys have to come out and be a powerhouse in five minutes. Like they have to get the whole crowd rallied behind them. It's a tough job. Anyone who's a good yeah. MC, I, sometimes I'll pay them more than I will the, the middle spot. And like you're talking about headlining, which is a seamless link into what I was going to speak about next. Um, last comic standing. So I, I've, it was NBC, and I don't know how easily accessible NBC is over here or was at the time. But tell, tell us a bit about what was that process like as you were going through it? Were you already <laughs> headlining? Was that kind of a lead into your headlining that's a great question. So yes, I had already been headlining, but I was not as big of a name as I wanted to be. I was on a show called Comic View on BET, which I know you guys also get, or at least got for a long time, because that's one of the things that brought me over there was my fame from BET. And I became like the most famous white guy on, on black entertainment television in the 90s. And 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 so then, you know, white clubs also hired me and, and mixed clubs and everything else. But it wasn't until Last Comic Standing that it became international, where people were calling me from other countries and asking me to come over and do shows. And it was quite the experience. Um, so the year I was on was the first year that the whole show went international. We ended up having two people from England. We had Gina Yashere and Matt, um, Matt, I'll think of Matt's name in a minute. Um, but it was a crazy season. We had... Um, a guy named Doug Benson was on there. Amy Schumer made her TV uh, debut on my season of Last Comic Standing. That's what made her get famous. And um, it was fun. But I'll tell you what, the, the thing about reality shows is I think I would have a much better time being on Survivor, Traders, one of those shows. Because the difference is, is if you screw up on Survivor, no one cares. You know what I mean? If you yeah, lose yeah. a challenge, no one cares. If you... Don't do well on something, no one cares. But when it's your own act, people go, oh, he, he's a failure. Or, mm -hmm. you know, because if you have one bad show on NBC, they're going to show it. They're not going to, like, re-edit it to make you look better. Yeah. So you feel like you're going to have a heart attack the entire time you're on the show because everyone's stressed out. Because we've seen other people fail and their careers tank because of one show on NBC. And was there any kind of fallout from the show that you've that you dealt with for a couple of years um i never had to deal with it but i will say this i feel like because there are game show rules sometimes these tv shows figure out ways around those rules so for example even though it's a game show and they have all these rules when i first um, audition for Last Comic Standing, they tell you, okay, you made it to the semifinals. Then we film the semifinals, and now we know who the cast is because they pick 10 people. Once the 10 people were picked, we know that for six months, we're just sitting around waiting to film in the summer. Well, guess what? NBC starts putting out a commercial about Last Comic Standing coming this summer. They, they put a, a comic named uh, John Reap and a comic named Lavelle Crawford at the beginning of the commercial, they show all these other auditioners that aren't on the show because I know the cast. And then they show two other people, the same two people from the beginning, John Reap and LaBelle Crawford at the end of the commercial again. So they bookended it with the same two guys. So when you watch the commercial and then you finally see the cast, the only two people that are famous to you are John Reap and LaBelle Crawford. So when me and Amy Schumer and Doug Benson would show up to a comedy club and the audience is out there greeting us, no one claps as we get off the bus. But the minute Lavelle Crawford and John Reap, who were not famous at the time, they just happened to be in the commercial. When they got off, everyone's cheering and clapping. And guess who were the final two? John Reap and Lavelle Crawford. So NBC picked them. They, you know, they had their tricks and they 
made it go that way. Of course, there was a time where me and the other comedians did get a vote. We could have kicked them off. And I told everyone, we have to get them out of here. And no one listened. And yeah, that's what happens. Then casting crews, producers, like they, they have the end goal in sight sometimes anyway, don't they? This is just the, the name of the do. game. They always do. Like before they you even know. audition, they have an idea of who those final sure. people are. You know how, I, how much I believe that? I can tell you. So when, when we filmed the semifinals, it's supposed to be two days worth. So you could watch it this week and next week, right? But we're filming it on the same day. And so on day one, they're going to announce five of us are the winners. And then that's how the show ends, right? And then the next day, they'll show the next people competing. And they'll pick five more winners. And that's how it ends. So there's two tents, day one, I mean, sorry, two trailers, day one trailer and day two trailer, these big tents full of, you know, comedians that are waiting around to hear if they won or not. So they say, we're going to pick five from tent one, and then we're going to shoot day two and pick five from day two, tent two. Well, I knew that I screwed up the producers because I won a, an audience favorite, which pushed me to making it like the audience voted me in. Everyone yeah. else was voted in by the producers. Well, I must have screwed them up because they film all my five people, me and four others, out of day one. When they go to shoot day two, they bring the cameras back into my tent and pick someone from day one to be part of day two, even though they shot day one already. So they ended up wanting this person so bad, they edited him in like he was in the day two cameras. You know what I mean? And yeah, so yeah, it was yeah. very crazy. I realized I was the whole reason for that. I was. I must have been on their list. So we see that, or because I know a few people have been on reality TV over here, and they've said almost exactly the same thing. Like during the process, it just gets tweaked every two seconds to get what they want out of the their goal. Um, that's television, isn't it? It's that's TV, man. But there it's, you go. It's a I bit know. Fair when when there's game show rules, and yeah. they still do that. Yeah. And I think that if I probably went after NBC, I could do that. But I'm also still in the business, and why would I do that? You know. Yeah. yeah. It's not a big deal to me. Big deal. So what? I was on a fun show. It made my career happy. I'm happy. I've moved on. Yeah. Yeah. I just do feel for the people who are led to believe it's the be all and end all. This is what you have to aim for. Once you get there, that's it. Like they're, I don't know, they're sent down the river sometimes. And it's so hard to watch. Um, I agree with that 100%. And it's like, I, I don't believe in that myself. Because yeah. I run um, what's called the U.S. Comedy Contest. And it's the biggest comedy contest over here. And we this is our 20th year. Some of the past winners are people like, I don't know if you know who Tony Baker is, but he's a big comic, Anthony Jesselnik. And... So it's a very fair contest. But the thing about it is I've never picked a winner before in my own contest. Yeah. You know, like I'm always shocked at who the winner is because I bring in 10 judges and I have no say in it. And I don't want to have a say in it because yeah. I want it as fair as possible. So when you see something that is unfair as a fair person, you just go, ick, you know, like, come on, guys. Yeah, literally. Just let it happen as it happens. Okay, so my next question then is, you were already on the circuit. You were already a comedian. Um, and you've got Golden Artist Entertainment. So you, you deal with a lot of Hollywood celebrities, big artists. I'm just going to name a couple just for our listeners. We've got Silky Up Meg Ganache from RuPaul's Drag Race. Love RuPaul's Drag Race. Taryn Manning from Orange is the New Black. And one that everyone will recognize here, Perez Hilton, who started out back in my day when I was like just going through celebrity gossip. Um, he was a Hollywood journalist, and he's like quite big and mainstream now. So in the background, whilst you're going through becoming a comedian, um, television comedy, and then was your talent management agency already running in the background, or is that something that came after the comedy? So, well, both are actually going at the exact same time. So like I said, I was just in, in um, Alaska performing. I think a couple of weeks before that, I was performing in Reno and Las Vegas, and I'm in Michigan this week, or no, I don't know where I am this week. Who knows? Um, <laughs> You'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm actually at a 
festival called Loons of the Lake in Minneapolis. Anyway, um, so here's what happened. I have been a comedian this, this year is 37 years. I started when I was 15 years old. And when about 10 years ago, my wife and I were writing for Joan Rivers on a TV show called Fashion Police. I was writing and directing late night infomercials. Do you guys ever get infomercials over there? Uh, we get commercials. Is I don't know if All that's right. so, the same. So infomercials like... are, are late night things that come on here in America. I don't know how far they go, but you know, there's something called the Sham Wow. There's something called the Slap Chop. You know, these late night little gadgets that they sell you for twenty bucks or whatever. So yeah, I was writing. We get those, directing. yeah. Yeah, the, the <laughs> famous uh, commercials um, over here, and I was writing and directing movies for other people. And my very smart wife said, "Why are we writing and directing for everyone else?" And why are we trying to find a manager when every celebrity is asking you to manage them because you make almost as much as they do and you're half as famous and they're trying to figure out the secret. And so I said, I don't I don't have enough time for this, blah, blah, blah. And she said, what if I set it all up? I will get a lawyer to form our company. And, and if, I said, fine, if you go through all that and you're that serious about it, I will form this company with you. And she did. And right away, celebrities wanted to sign up with us because I had known them my whole life. And it really, really took off. And we've been making movies and documentaries. And we've had giant A-list celebrities with us. And it's been quite the journey. And then five years into it, COVID hit, right? And now, <laughs> or four or six years into whatever, then COVID hit. So we went through years of that. And then, I don't know if you guys saw this news over there, but just last year, we suffered a full year of strikes. The Screen Actors Guild went on strike. Did the writers that. went yeah. on strike. So it was like between that and COVID, three of the years we were almost out of business. And lots of places did go out of business. Mm -hmm. I would say a third of all comedy clubs in America went out of business because of COVID. A third. That's a lot. That's a lot. And some because the people died, you know. Yeah. Um, it was a crazy time. And then work because some states were more lenient than, say, California. All of a sudden, you've got production companies and actors saying, well, I'll move to Nevada. Screw it. They're, they're wild over there. They don't care about masks. We'll go film now. And it just it's we've all had to figure out this wild west of entertainment, you know, and it's also not channels one through 13 anymore. Like when we were kids, now you've got a thousand channels and things don't pay as much. Yeah. Because you don't have 50 million viewers per channel anymore. You've got, you know, 800,000. Or I think the Tonight Show, when Johnny Carson was on it, everyone in America watched it. Now, it's lucky if it gets a million views a night. Yeah. So d did Nevada become the new Hollywood for six months? <laughs> it's become the place where I would say half of the comedians that lived in Los Angeles moved. Okay. And... You know, Mark Wahlberg just moved there and is opening up a new movie studio. Um, yeah, Las Vegas has become a big place for movies. So has Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I talked to an agent and you know how I said a third of all com comics or comedy clubs are missing. She, she said to me recently that a third of all work from Hollywood is now moved out of Hollywood. That's okay, I guess. I mean, you got there's thousands of shows that need to be filmed. Mm -hmm. There's still plenty of work here in Los Angeles. It's not like it's a ghost town here. Yeah. Everyone's working. Just for me, I've seen quite a lot of new movies happen in San Francisco. Yep. Um, and Canada. More yes, Canada I, I'm a massive big one. I'm a massive film buff. And I realized just in the last couple of years, I'm seeing Canada an awful lot. And Toronto I'm seeing, especially, yeah. Yeah. And I'm seeing a lot of uh, San Francisco as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, I, you know, at the beginning you said you might learn some gossip. I'm, I'm open to all of that. But I'll teach you guys something. You, as a film buff, you can go back and, and check out. So for years, I had a very interesting job. And, I mean, I still get called for it, but it's less and less with CGI being how it is. But for about since like the 90s until maybe just about COVID, I was the only warm up comedian for movies. So anytime like you go see a TV show, there's a warm up comic that will come out, tell some jokes, say, hey, guys, keep your energy up. When you see this sign, applaud, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Anytime a movie had thousands of extras, they didn't pay all of them. They would only pay about 100. That's all you can afford. 
So if you're filling up Yankee Stadium or a, a stadium here in America or something like that to film a movie, they are begging these people to show up. So what they would do is they would hire me. I would keep them entertained between takes. And then they would give me tons of prizes like cars to give away or signed autographs from Brad Pitt and Angelina or or their private you know, collection of sunglasses will be given away or something crazy yeah. from the movie. And I did this on hundreds of movies, like every major movie. But the trick that I was gonna tell you is they also in the old days, in the 90s, what they would do is they brought in blow up dolls and put clothing on them because that was also a cheaper way than paying someone. So anytime you watch a TV show or anything, like watch Seinfeld, if they go to a ball, ball game and you can see into the crowd, Look up there, and if you really pause it, you're going to see about every 10th person is a blow-up doll in the background. So funny. <clears throat> and then later what they figured out is, you know how they'll do like a cardboard cutout of someone? Now that's what they were doing towards the end is cardboard cutouts. But what's funny is it's the same cardboard cutouts. They'll have like 100 of one man, 100 of one woman, and then 100 of another man. And then if you look, you're looking at the same guy with the same yellow shirt 100 times in the crowd. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> it's really fun to go back to movies made probably in the early 2000s and 90s just to see all of that. There's one in um there's one over here. I don't know if you've seen Roald Dahl's The Witches. The, no. or, the original. Um so the witches are all bald. So their hair comes out and they turn into these ugly witches and they just got loads of bald men to sit. So when all the women pull their hair out it's just loads of bald men in dresses. <laughs> it's hilarious. <clears throat> but there's one to look out for from over here. Um, okay, so that's brilliant. It didn't happen overnight for your management company because um, you've got some really big names. So for people over here in the UK, some of our listeners will want to know how do they make it when they come to LA as a fresh-faced wannabe? What do they have to do? Great question. So I can tell you the basics that you have to have, and they can write this down if they want. Every agency and every management company is going to say you have to be signed up on two websites. One is called Actors Access, and one is called Casting Networks. Casting Networks is mostly uh, for commercials, and Actors Access is the big breakdown. So that is what your agent needs you to be signed up on so they can send you out for the next Tom Cruise movie or Kevin Hart movie or whatever the case may be. Um, so that's always the first thing I say. Don't come out here without those two things and they're free to sign up. Don't come out here if you don't already have a good headshot. People come out here taking a selfie in front of like a window and they go, hey, will you hire me? And I'm like, are you joking? So I always tell people, Think of yourself as a brand like Coca-Cola and present yourself as such. If Coca-Cola wouldn't take some quick selfie and send it out to people as, oh, can we use this in my next commercial? Why would you? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I would say come out here and the biggest mistake people make is they say, I will give this a good two year try. And if that doesn't work, I'm out of here. Well, guess what? 99.999% of people who say that will leave here with nothing because you don't usually get anything in the first couple of years. You don't. And so you have to come out here with a plan, which is longevity, because the people with longevity are the ones that know everyone, that get work still. I mean, there's people who are still around from the 90s when I was performing who aren't even that good, but because they know everyone now, they get work all the time. And I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying, like, there's probably better people showing up to, to Los Angeles that could outdo them. But because of the longevity, they're still here. So don't give yourself a short goal. Plus, it's gorgeous here. You know, it's I, I'm I don't know. I don't even need a jacket. It's probably 75 degrees year round. Um, it's come out here knowing that you want to do something for yourself that will take time. And if you have to do something secondary to make it happen, like wait tables or keep your day job, who cares? Yeah. Who cares? You have to have that in, in England. So what do you care if you have one here? Yeah. There's no, you know, the only thing you have to make sure of is that you, if you have a job that they're going to allow you to go do auditions. But today, here's something most people don't even know if you're not in this business, you don't have to show up for auditions anymore. They make it so easy. You film yourself at home now. 
So I get the script and instead of having to memorize it in an hour and run to some audition and be like, um, blah, 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 I can memorize it at home, look right into the camera. If that one doesn't work, I hit start over. I do it a hundred times and then I send them something perfect, which yeah. I like better. Some actors go, oh, I want to be in the room. I have to be. They have to see my personality. Fine. Fine with you. But most actors would prefer not to have to leave their day job to go do it. They could film something even at lunchtime. Yeah. Um, it's it's much easier. I love technology. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I grew up without it. And with self-tapes, self I know over here, a lot of the agencies over here are saying, you've got until 5 p.m. on Wednesday. You get days worth of your time to get sorted. Like with an audition, you have those 15 minutes. That's it. Like, that's it. Yeah, that's and it. You don't even get 15 minutes. When you go in for an audition, you get two minutes. And yeah. if you skip one word or you flip out somehow or you just anything goes wrong, you're done. Yeah. They say goodbye. But you're right. The other way, you have three days to film it a thousand times. Exactly. Yeah. Change your hair if you don't like anything you want. And so people complaining about that, I'm like, you're cuckoo in the head. A little bit. This couldn't be easier. <laughs> You know, I hear comedians complain to me. I'm like, hey, can you help promote the show? I don't have time to promote. That doesn't work for me. I grew up in a time where literally in the 1980s, there was no internet. If I wanted people to come to my show, I would put a piece of paper on tables that said Dante's um, sign up list. Please send me your address so that I can mail you, mail a flyer, hoping that you show up to my show in two weeks. And I would have to buy stamps and envelopes. Stumps? And handwrite everything. What stumps? <laughs> right. And now if these lazy people can press one button and it goes out to a thousand people. Yeah. So anytime someone's lazy in this business, I'm just like, poo poo on That's you. That's it. Yeah. So talking about your shows then, other than LCS, what is the biggest and best shows you've done in your career? Gosh, I would have to say that show that I did on BET called Comic View was really life changing for me in the way that I was boosted to a fame level that I'm glad I don't have anymore. Um, I was so famous from that because when I was on BET, I must have filmed 11 different episodes over eight years and they would air me almost every single day because they would show four different episodes a day every day of the week. So like 10 in the morning, 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. I was usually on TV at least once a day on BET. And then by 1996 until 1999, BET gave me a sitcom where I was, it was more of an ensemble. It wasn't just mine. It wasn't like, you know, everybody loves Raymond or something. It was um, like Taxi. There were about five main cast members. We ran a hotel. And every week we had two celebrities check into the hotel. So it was sort of like a celebrity hotel. Okay, yeah. But I was very proud that Richard Pryor, who's my hero, was um, he made his last TV appearance on my sitcom. And it was a bit sad because at that point he already had MS and we had spoken to him on the phone, me and a, a guy named Paul Mooney. I don't know if you know who he is, but no. he, if you ever watched the Dave Chappelle show, he was a big guy on there. But Paul Mooney was... Richard Pryor's best friend and head writer, and he was the head writer of my sitcom. And when Richard showed up, he couldn't speak. And so he had a handler with him, this guy, David, who had been his you know, friend and everything for years. So we figured out David is going to pretend Richard's whispering to him and David would just say all the lines for him. So he'd, he'd lean down and go, Mr. Pryor says, blah, 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 blah. And so that's how we ended up doing it. It wasn't what we wanted or expected, but it turned out fine. But yeah, sadly, that was the day he kind of stopped speaking and that was it, you know. But I was very proud to be a part of all of that and that show. But I was glad to give up that fame because I like my fame now. My fame now is I can sell 500 tickets, 300 tickets, 200 tickets somewhere, and I can still go eat lunch somewhere. You yeah. know what I mean? Someone might say hi to me in an airport. Hey, I love your stuff and whatever. But I'm not eating and going, okay, you guys, this is like the 20th picture. I haven't even touched my food yet, you know? Yeah, or, yeah. or, you know, now I'm in the paper because I drove past uh, a protest. Oh, was he part of the protest? Did he do, you know, all, I'm, I'm glad I don't have that. I don't want that kind of fame. I want fans that like me enough to just 
want to say hi, give me a hug and move on. Yeah. And you've got, a, a, I'm going to say, what I've written here is a comedy family because you mentioned your wife earlier. Um, so just for the listeners, Rebecca Kochan or Kochan? Kochan. 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 Um, and Rebecca has actually, you would, you would if you've seen the horror movie, <laughs> you will recognize her. Um, she's been in movies with Leslie Joseph and Robert Buckley, who I recognized from iZombie on Netflix. Um, and she's a comedian as well, like you said. Do you guys do yes. double comedy shows or comedy double so shows? We don't go up at the same time like like Gracie and, and Alan. We go up, um, she'll go up before me. She's usually the feature. However, this time in Alaska, she was the headliner and I opened for her happily. I would do that every time. I would rather her be the one in the light than me. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, a little background on her. Yeah, if you're a horror movie fan, she's been in like 20 horror movies. She's actually one of the most famous actresses in LGBTQ movies. She did a movie called Eating Out 20 years ago. We just went to the 20 year anniversary two weeks ago. <clears throat> it became the biggest gay comedy cult movie of all time. So then they made part two. That one became the biggest gay comedy cult movie of all time. Then they made number three. That became the biggest. And four and five. It's These are bigger than the Ameri uh, American Pie movies that came out, but for gay men. But yes. they're similar. You know, just kind of funny comedy movies. And, man, it's crazy, that fame. They've had her in gay pride parades. Drag queens dress up with, as her. I mean, half of our gay clients are gay client, uh, are clients of ours because they went, oh, my God, it's you. <laughs> and now she's like, hey, you know, I mean, every time we see any gay celebrity, she's like, oh, my God, that's so and so from Drag Race. And then they recognize her. And now they're screaming while she's screaming. It's really great. <laughs> so I'm so funny. proud of her. Yeah. <clears throat> and when it comes to writing, I know you've have you self-produced movies? Am I yes. right in thinking? And did you write that together? Yes, yeah, so we, we've written a bunch of movies, yeah. um, and, and some people have seen them. Like, we uh, wrote a movie, and I directed it, called Bro, What Happened? It stars Jamie Kennedy and Bobby Lee and Lorenzo Lamas and a whole bunch of other great people were in it. And it's basically super bad meets The Hangover. It was these kids wake up a after a party, and bad things have happened, and they have to figure out what happens before this guy's girlfriend shows up. So it's one of those kind of fun movies. Um, but yes, we did a, a movie called House of Karma. It's a horror movie coming out that we wrote, she directed. Um, just tons, you know. We've got a new documentary that I am still selling, so I don't want to pitch it too hard. But it's about a giant celebrity that got in trouble during Me Too. And I have hours and hours of footage, so can't wait to sell it. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Let me just... Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please do. So I'm very interested. Was COVID weird for you guys? Because over here, it turned political where people forgot it was a world pandemic. So they thought, even now, they're like, our doctor over here, his name is Fauci. And basically said, wear masks. Don't go outside. Don't, you know, stay six feet away, blah, blah, blah. Now he's in front of our Congress because, oh, you made us wear masks and masks don't always work. And we still got COVID and we had to get vaccinations. And it's like, it was a world pandemic, you idiots. You know, like over here in America, I don't know how it is there. Like I said before, it's so gang-like that you meet people every day where you go, how's your family? I haven't spoken to my family since Trump was elected. You know, they yeah. just don't speak to me and, you know, things like that. And that's never happened in our country before. There's a there's a bit of a divide at the moment, and it's I think it's been gradual from the Brexit thing, because Brexit was going through, and then nobody could come to a decision, and that lasted about three or four years or whatever, and everyone's like, when's it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Is it going to get pulled? Then it actually happened, and everyone's like, oh, I didn't think that was actually going to happen. It's just like there's just constant two or three sides of society right. just going nah 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 we can't nobody right. agrees on anything people are idolizing people with money like we all i don't but i i noticed that if someone walks in the room and someone goes oh that guy's a millionaire all of a sudden they're staring and pointing like this person is a a celebrity yeah like what is that what that's insane <clears throat> 
That makes no sense to me. No, and do you know because what? Also in California, everything's so expensive. Everyone's a millionaire. If yeah. you own a house and you bought it for thirty thousand, it's now a two million dollar house. There's this. Not everyone, obviously, but there's a perception that if you have millions, that you don't deserve that. That should be given to someone else. And I have this conversation so often. Like, if you've worked for years to get to that stage and you have made that money yourself, how can someone come along and say you should give that to that person? I agree. The only me. big difference I would say, and I'm with you on that, it doesn't need to go to anyone. But the only thing I would say is they are never taxed like the rest of us. You know, Donald Trump finally had to turn in his taxes and he paid $800 in the year he was hiding. I paid more than that. And he's a billionaire. I paid more than the 800. And that's what makes us angry is when mm. you go, you know, people always go, but things were better in America in the 50s and 60s. Yes, because million, anyone over 200,000 was being taxed 90%, 90%. And they were still the richest people in America. And Americans had more money. You know, back when I, my mom was growing up, my grandfather bought a house. He had a new car. And he bought a new car every year and he supported the entire family. Wife never had a job and he wasn't even the manager. He worked at a hardware store. That's it. Just at a hardware store. And in the you know 50s, you could buy a house and cars and everything else. And now everyone I know has three jobs and they're all going, oh, my God, I can't afford to my rent. I can't afford to live. We have to have three jobs. You know, it's it's disgusting what's happening. Yeah. Okay, because of social media. People are afraid to talk about how they're upset about finances and things like that because everyone on social media, unless you're the consummate complainer, like some people are, or, oh, woe is me all day, everyone else is going, life's great. And look at, we went out today and we yeah. had this burger. And then you come home and you're like, oh my God, how am I going to pay for the burger? <laughs> Literally, yeah. Especially over here. In relation to how much things cost, the gap had just got bigger and bigger and bigger over the last... 30, 40, 50 years. Sure. And, and a lot of it's big corporate greed, you know? And it, I, I just wish that our president would stand up to at least our corporations and say no more. Mm. If you want to do business here, then you make it a fair price. And if you don't, then we're just going to overtax you and you can leave. So that, hey, let's, that, let's bring it full circle. That's why we need comedy in our lives. And I've noticed comedy is booming right now because people are depressed all over the world and they want to hear jokes. I mean, that's how... Charlie Chaplin became famous is the world was going crazy and he's the one making fun of it, you yeah. know, and making fun of being poor and making fun of Hitler and all that other stuff. You want to know something neat? I live in a house built by Charlie Chaplin. That is amazing. I'll sign, yeah, I'll, I'll turn around and show you. So my house was built by Charlie Chaplin. I live right behind his Charlie Chaplin studios here in Hollywood, which are now the Muppet studios. Oh, I love but it. Yeah, so this house wasn't his. His house was a couple blocks away. I can walk to it from here. But no, he built this house as a bungalow to hold actors and to have them do their makeup and things like that. And the studio that he had, it now has a roof on it. But in the old days, it didn't have a roof because you had to have sunlight because they didn't even have lights back then. And the Makes gas sense. lamps weren't going to do it. So I, I live in a piece of history here in Hollywood. I love that. I absolutely love that. Me too. Me too. It feels special, this house. It's lucky. Some guy drove past my gate one night and I was outside, you know, I don't know, talking to my wife and he was in a real tall truck so I could see him over my fence. And he goes, hey, is this blah, blah, blah? And, uh, and I said, yeah. He goes, I lived here like 10 years ago. I go, oh, cool. He goes, I mean it. And he like described my house inside. I went, oh, you did live here. And he goes, man, this is a lucky house. He goes, did you know someone won an Academy Award in this house? Someone got an Emmy in this house? And he goes, I moved because I won the lottery. He goes, I'm serious. I bought this truck with it. And then he's like, all right, good luck, man. And he drove off. I was like, holy cow. I'm glad that guy drove by. That was an interesting story. I'm coming to stay for a week. <laughs> yeah. I actually made all these signs out in front of my house. And one of them says it's the good luck house. So people come by and they touch it now. Do you get um, bus tours coming past? We get lots of bus tours, but they don't necessarily stop at my house. I think that they should. If they knew the history of it, yeah. I bet you that they would. And I bet you if I ever stopped one of those guys and told them, but then I bet you at some point I'd be like, oh, man, I wish I never told those guys. Yeah. But my camera's movable. Do you want to see what I do? Can I show you something? Yeah, go on. So because I love tourists and I love Hollywood, 
I'm going to show you what I've done outside my house. So first I'm gonna show you one thing this way. I don't know if you can see the end of my street up here. Yeah. But that's Hollywood Boulevard is just at the end of my street. Beautiful. And then over here, I make signs for all the tourists telling them which way to go to Hollywood and things like this. I don't know if you can see all of these, but it oh, says that's like, amazing. Yeah. <coughs> so for just Hollywood. for the listeners, there's like all these little arrows and signs on trees. They're all pointing in different directions. Oh, that's a that's brilliant. They've all got little messages on it. I love so, that. Yeah. Yeah. Hollywood. Hollywood. So I get a lot of tourists taking pictures of my signs already and figuring out because it tells them where to go. All the signs say like Hollywood Boulevard, turn left here, go this way. Um, you know who Mariska Hargate is from Law and Order? No. Do you guys not get Law and Order over we, there? We do, you? but I've not seen it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Somebody, sure somebody will. Yeah, is. somebody will know who it is. So she is a big actress over here. She's on Law and Order SVU, and um, her brother owns a gardening store right across the street from my house. So last week, she was there. We were just driving by. I'm like, oh my gosh, there she is. But that's that's Hollywood for you. That's brilliant. And did yeah. you did you go to university in LA as well, or was that? I went to university in um, San Diego where I grew up and it was called United States International University. And I'll give you another piece of gossip and trivia. I think this there was is a where guy, I was heading. <laughs> go I on. Figured. So there was, uh, uh, all right, well, let's go back a little. So in high school, there was a, a, a guy when I first started comedy, I was a kid and, and I went to the comedy store and you had to be 21 to get in, but I thought I'll go there and see if I can run in and perform and run out. So I walk up and there's this kid I know from school. Have you ever seen the movie Friday or Elf or any of those movies? So yeah. his name is Faison Love. He's the big heavy set black guy who played the manager in Elf. He played Big Worm in Friday. He's in a million movies. Yeah. Anyway, he and I went to junior high and high school together. And I show up to the comedy store. And he's sitting there as the bouncer. And I went, you're not 21. And he goes, shut up. I look 50. <laughs> he did. He always looked 50. <laughs> He goes, I'll tell you what, I'm going to tell them that you're, you know, 19 and a half. That way you only have to wait a year and a half. And when I was only 16. So anyway, he, he helps me get in. And then I go to college and this one uh, girl comes up to me at my work. I was working at a movie theater and she goes, hey, my boyfriend, Eric Bishop, wants to be a comedian. Can you help him, you know, get into the comedy store and write some stuff and all this stuff? And she goes, please don't tell him I was here. He's very jealous. He's going to think I was, you know, came here because I like you. So I show up to my college, USIU, the next day. And it was right by where Top Gun was based off of. It's called Miramar is where my school was. And so I, I pull into the parking lot. And sure enough, Eric Bishop is walking quickly to my car, angrily. Hey, ah! I was like, oh, no. And he's like, what was my girlfriend doing at your place last night? I said, man. I'm not supposed to tell you any of this, but here's the truth. So I said, she just showed up because she wanted to help you get into comedy and blah, blah, blah. So we hug it out and everything's fine. I call the comedy store and I say, hey, I've got a friend in school who wants to perform. Can you get him up? And they said, no, but you can give him half of your time. Because I think they gave us like seven minutes. So they go three and a half for him, three and a half for you. So I give him half of my time and he does great. And he starts coming there and Faison and him become friends and me and everybody. We're all hanging out. And then I go back to school that that winter and Eric isn't there. And, and I'm like, where's my Eric? And people go, oh, he moved to L.A. He's on a new show called uh, In Living Color. And I didn't know this show, but this is a show that, you know, the Wayans had. And it's what made Jim Carrey famous. And I would watch the, you know, the beginning of it. If I were at the comedy store, I turned on real quick to see if I could see him on there. And nothing. And never I it would always say this guy, that guy's on it, the Wayans. And then it started just showing names. Well, I didn't recognize the name because he had changed it to Jamie Foxx and he now has an Academy Award. How crazy, right? That's bonkers. That's a great story. I love that. Yeah, it's bonkers, man. Bonkers. Yeah, he told me, uh, he invited me to one of his tapings one time and I said, why'd you change your name? And he said he was in some comedy festival or contest and he was submitting to them and they weren't accepting men anymore. So he just turned in a resume with the name Jamie Foxx hoping they would think he was a woman and let him in. 
And that's exactly what happened. And when he showed up as a man, they weren't going to tell him no. And he ended up winning the festival or the contest. And so that's what helped him get on the TV show. So why change the name back? That's great. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But over here, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Baby Reindeer show. I have heard. Uh, no, I haven't. <clears throat> so there's a British comedian. Um, and he decided to write a series about some of his antics when he was on stage comedy and he was being stalked by someone um and that's now a netflix show and there's it's just taken off and it's skyrocketed and i was going to ask everyone keeps telling me to watch this and it's it's definitely worth a watch i think um but i was going to ask if you've got anything like that that you've written that you might want produced or you're going to produce yourself or anything like that with all these history as, as far as the craziness that happens in my life well, well what i've done is i've actually written a book about it and i'm hoping to get it published and someone gave me a great piece of advice so that one actor that got in trouble is also in my book so i'll just tell you so uh years ago i was ron jeremy's manager not for porn um do you know who ron jeremy is i don't know somebody okay, somebody will yeah, yeah. He's the most famous porn star on the planet. Okay. He, he's terrible looking. He's short, squat, big mustache, terrible hair, everything. But anyway, he's the biggest on the planet. And he was the only one who was ever able to cross over to mainstream. And so I didn't, I didn't book him in porn. I booked him in mainstream stuff. Well, he got in trouble with the Me Too stuff over here and ended up going to jail. And the day he went to jail, I said to him, I said, I hope you didn't do any of this. But if you did, I hope you rot in hell. And he goes, fair enough, fair enough. I said, I'm going to have to, you know, send out a letter to the newspaper saying this. He goes, fair enough. Can I have my lawyer's phone number? And we never spoke. So what's happened is I wrote this book about my life and I realized he was a full chapter. And when I presented it to a couple of friends who've written books, they said, oh, my God, Dante, you need to write just the Ron Jeremy book. And once that is popular, then you sell your book because they're going to expect a second book. Because my book is all stories like Jamie Foxx, like. You know, and that one is probably the least interesting out of 10,000 stories in my book. You know, all of my stories are crazy like that. All of them to where you go, you're joking. And it's like, you know, someone said to me, man, a lot of this must be about when you ran for mayor of Los Angeles. I said, honestly, it's two paragraphs. That's how interesting the rest of the book is. I wrote two paragraphs and went, I, I don't have time for running for mayor. There's too many other stories in here. Yeah. Well, we will look forward to it when it comes out. There's not even a title. So, yeah, just look for a book by me. It's called... And if people want to search me in the meantime, just Dante. Don't worry about my last name. I don't even know how to say it. I think you pronounced it right. Or it's pronounced SpaghettiOs. I'm not sure. I'll go with SpaghettiOs for now. Yeah, why not? Like, for the listeners, when I was writing down Dante's surname, I had to f siphon it off into three parts so that I made sure ah! that I said it properly. <laughs> Right. My last name is spelled, just so you guys know, it's R-U-S-C-I-O-L-E-L-L-I. -L -L -I. It's a million letters long. It makes no sense. Who knows what it is? And I split it into three parts to make sure that I pronounced it. <laughs> Not one syllable got missed. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciated it. You're, you're a great host, by the way. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're a great guest. Um, now, I was going to ask, just before we finish up, um, when it comes to content for comedy, at the moment, there's a lot of um, people get, I'm, I'm using air quotes for the listeners, getting cancelled. Um, how do you structure your comedy with so much of this cancel culture and people having too much of offend, offended in their life? What do you do? Well... You know, it's a great question. I, I just fight fire with fire. And here's the thing. I would consider myself a good person. I consider myself well-read. I consider myself accepting of all people, you know? And so if you come to a comedy show and I say something off color and it offends you, that's your fault. You paid to come see me. You know what I mean? And I, as a comedian, I am going to filter myself to where the only rule I have is I'm not there to hurt anyone's feelings or make someone cry. Other than that, if I say a word that might offend you, that's your fault. It is. Anything like that, if someone tries to cancel me, I promise you other comics are going to come to the rescue. 
But if a comic does go out and says something mean or hurtful or, you know, like uh, the guy from Seinfeld, Michael Richards, he said the N-word on stage here at the Laugh Factory 20 years ago, and no one's heard from him since. That's how hard he got canceled. Um, because he hurt people's feelings, and it hurt, and it still hurts, you know, to even talk about it. I'm sure to some people to think, oh, God, that guy I liked, he said that. So it's not that case with most comics. It's, it's you know, you said a word that may be offensive today that wasn't offensive before. Yeah. You know? Um, like, even our president got in trouble last year because he used the word oriental. And people were like, you can't say oriental anymore. And it's like, most people don't, we don't have a list of what words we, we can and can't say. Like, to me, oriental it sounds like the nicest, most fancy word to describe. I wish I lived in the Orient. It sounds like the most cool place ever you yeah, know what yeah. i mean but if that offends people then i just won't say it anymore but we also have to get a list of things if you want to you know if we're not allowed to say them you better tell us up yeah, front. Yeah. you can't just people over using words we've always used so the trigger for you is if they start crying in the audience that's your no trigger. not even that because I, I i don't mind if i make people cry if they come to a show and i make you cry on accident that's your fault because everything i'm saying is not full of malice and it's there to make you laugh yeah. so if you took it wrong i'll tell you i'll give you a good example I have a dumb joke. I don't even know why it's funny or how it works. But I say, um, you can't, because in America, people used to call American Indians, 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 instead of Indian, Indians. But I say, because everyone's so woke today, you can't say the word engine anymore. It's offensive to trains people. Boom, it's a train joke, okay? I'm not talking about American Indians. I'm not talking about anything. Some ladies came to my show a couple weeks ago went up to the manager right afterwards and said I told a trans joke. Trans. And the manager came up to me afterwards and said, did you do a trans joke? And I said, if I did, am I in trouble? But no, I told a train joke. Those ladies got offended by a train joke. Anyway, moving inside because the LAPD is now circling my house. Oh, brilliant. What did you do? Yeah, they're always, they're always <laughs> looking for someone out there. Well, that was all I wanted to ask about... Uh triggers because it's comedy subjective do you know what i mean of course and i and look comics aren't trying to offend people but their, their job yeah. is also to mirror the world and to say things and so you know people just need to be uh more liberal uh minded when it comes to going to a show if you're going there with the intent of getting offended you probably are you're probably going to yeah um just go have fun i mean that should be your escape it's like the reason I don't talk about politics on stage is because it's like Charlie Chaplin, you know, they're going there for the laugh for the hour to get away from being broke or worrying about, you know, political gangs or anything else. Yeah. I, do you know what? You mentioned Seinfeld a couple of minutes ago, and I just need to ask a question. Have you worked with him or have you met him? Yes and yes. Okay. And... So this is my kind of take on the last couple of months over here. What we see from Seinfeld and his recent ap appearances, and I feel like he's he's really rude based on what I knew from him 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Is he nice? Can you just put my mind at rest? Is he nice? Because <laughs> um, I feel like he's not. Maybe he is, because uh, maybe he is, but the two times I met him, he was kind of rude to me. I'll be honest with you. Okay. And I met him before he was famous. I met him one time when I was still living in San Diego and a comedian said, hey, I just worked with this guy in the Midwest. His name is Jerry Seinfeld. When you move up to L.A., tell him, you know, Lamont says hi. We had a nice time. I walk into the improv one night. I look at the lineup and it says Jerry Seinfeld. I went, oh, that, I, I, who knew I'd run into this guy? And so I asked someone, who's Jerry Seinfeld? They point him out. I go up to him and I say, excuse me, Jerry. Um, and I'm about to talk and he goes, I'm watching the show. Just like that. I said, okay, just wanted to tell you, someone wanted to say, I, I'm watching the show. I was like, all right. And I walked away. And that was before he was famous. That so, answers my question. Because he's that... nice, I bet he, maybe he is, maybe he is, but he was never <laughs> nice to me. Well, like, on, on some of the chat show interviews, I heard the way he spoke to other people, and I was like, he actually seems quite rude. Um, and I was just hoping that could have been... I bet he is. I, I'm sure he's yeah. been famous too long. And if he started off rude, why would he change when he got famous? Well, that makes sense. But yeah. Adam Sandler's probably the nicest guy in show business, just so you know. And why do you say that? Tell, tell us why because you say that. Because every time I've ever worked with him, he's always working with his friends. He's always nice to every fan that walks up. 
you know how I said I worked on all those movies? I probably worked on about six or seven of his. And one time I was doing The Longest Yard. And you know those motor, those scooters you stand on? When those first came out, he had one of the first ones anyone had ever seen, right? And so he would ride it out to the set every day. And during lunch, I had a celebrity lookalike contest. And this one teenage kid looked just like a young Adam Sandler. And so he won a prize from me, right? And so when uh, Adam came out after lunch, I said, hey, Adam, I want you to meet the guy who won the whatever. He's your twin. So the, I call a kid out from the audience. Uh, Adam comes over and he grabs my microphone, starts talking to the kid, and then he gives the kid his scooter. He goes, um, you want my scooter? And the kid goes, yeah, I'll drive it around. He goes, no, 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 I'm giving it to you. Someone bring him the battery. And he like gave this kid the battery and the scooter. And he was just like that everywhere we went, any time. Like if I had to say something to him. It wasn't like, oh yeah, I'm in a hurry, I gotta go. It was always like, uh-huh, yes. Yeah. Like, one, And I've never heard a bad word about him. I love that. Me too. I love that. Me too. He's a good dude. Yeah. There's lots of good people in this business, really. I'm sure that there's just rude people in, in, in every job. And there's people who get weird with power in every job. And so if they get this kind of power, it just exacerbates it. Yeah. I, I just, I've always, in for me, I've always liked to believe, the, give people the benefit of the doubt and think if somebody is mainstream around the world, they probably get sick of people. And like you say, your level of fame is kind of lessened and it's more manageable. You don't get as annoyed anymore. So Right. I would assume all of them should be angry because I would be if you just, you know, you want that fame until you get it. Until yeah. you can't go to the store. Until you have to send people to go do things for you and nothing's easy. It's sort of like, I think we were reading that book by um, Prince Harry and in it, you know, this woman was like, well, let's just meet at this restaurant. And he's like, you don't get it. I can't just go meet at a restaurant. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, like I would hate that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm happy in my studio. I'm all good. <laughs> now I did it. Um, I was on tour a few years ago. Um, and when I was on local tours, like after coming out the theater and just for a couple of days, like I'd be there for a few weeks, but even just a couple of days, people would come up and it was never masses but i was just like if it's manageable i can deal with it it's nice to be nice but it's also probably would great on me like if it got any more just right i don't think it's good for people i mean i mean especially like these reality stars because that's total different fame now you're basing it on what they've really done bad in real life instead of just playing a bad guy on tv yeah. or in a movie Next thing you know, I mean, I'm sure someone's going to make a documentary someday about how many reality stars' lives have been ruined or how many people have killed themselves from being on these crazy shows. It's pretty sad, but I'm yeah. like I said, I'm glad I have the fame I have, and I don't need much more than what I have. Well, well done to you. You're doing great. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, my friend. Thank you. But it's you don't nice. need me to tell you that. <laughs> um, so tell us about what you are promoting coming up what's going on okay so if anyone wants to follow me just so you'll you'll find out when my book is and all those other things i am dante d-a-n-t-e the comic on all social media my website is comicdante.com. my company is golden artists plural uh entertainment uh, golden artists entertainment and i have uh two albums out that people can download um i have dante does dallas and i have another one called <laughs> Dante's Divine Comedy. I named it the exact same thing as Dante Alighieri's book because I figured if I get enough college students accidentally downloading my comedy album, I'll be rich. <laughs> that is the best. Like, what's the what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Plan. That's the best yeah. marketing strategy ever, isn't it? I, have, I just put it out this year, so I haven't even seen the numbers yet, but I'm really hoping on college campuses people are making a lot of mistakes fix right now yeah it's just, it's all about the hits it's all about the hits <laughs> yes it's that's it i don't need them like you said you only need them to watch for six seconds and i still get paid yeah that is amazing okay is there anything else you want to cover before i wrap up i think that's it i just next time i want to hear more about you have okay. me on again let's i'll interview yeah you definitely next put a list of questions together <laughs> and it's all about me 
We'll do it. Okay, Thank well, you for well, having me. I appreciate it. You're more than welcome. And for the listeners, that is a stunning bit of advice. And Dante, it has actually been genuinely great to chat with you today. So I'm not just saying that. Can I please thank you so much for all your wisdom, thank you. all your advice. You've been a great insight and an energy for all our listeners and anyone watching the video as well. And you've even talked me into getting over to LA. So Good. I might come I over. So. <laughs> Hit me up when you do. Yeah, don't worry. I will. Um, you Good. can show me your signs. So <laughs> thanks again. And to those of you listening, please do be sure to check out Dante and his uh, books and links before you go. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and make sure that you do not miss these great conversations. You guys can keep the conversation going on my social media, Gordy Camp TV on Facebook and at Gordy Camp over on Instagram and threads. So until next time, take care of yourself and others and keep laughing. I'm off to pack my bags. I'm going to LA. Bye. Yes, you're going to Hollywood. 